Good evening, Northside, and thank you for joining me. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our norm. These days, we go through um, some reflections uh, from the sermon that would have been preached last week. And last week, Pastor Gary preached on um, Ezra chapter 6. And uh, in Ezra chapter 6, um, it, it follows up from Ezra chapter 5, where we saw that the rebuilding of the, um, the temple uh, is resumed after the prophecies by Haggai and Zechariah that rebuked the people of God to um, resume the building project. Uh, and also we realize that Tatanai and his associates, uh, Tatanai, who was the governor of the trans-Euphrates, uh, with his associates, they uh, bend together and um, question the building project. And then they wrote to King Darius asking uh, whether the building pro the project should continue or should it be stopped. Uh, and we see now that, uh, that they did not stop the rebuilding. We know in chapter 4 they stopped rebuilding. But when it came to chapter 5, when they resumed, and even when they were questioned by Tatanai and his associates, they continued to build. They did not stop. And then the information goes to King Darius, and King Darius made his research. And after his research, he makes a decree that the rebuilding should continue. And the building does continue with the blessing of the Lord and with the blessing of a pagan king whom God had moved. He had moved his heart that it should continue and it did continue. And so today um, I would like to do two things. I would like to give you some questions for reflection, uh, which I hope you will uh, have time to go through and try to answer them um, faithfully and also to try to apply them to life. The other thing I would like to do is also to give you my reflections after the sermon was preached, after it moved my heart. Um, I thought it would be good for me to share some reflections with you, uh, which uh, came out of my own reflection of, uh, of the message of the passage. So uh, before I, uh, I read the passage, uh, which I would like to reflect on today from the same uh, chapter, I would like to give you uh, some questions uh, from the last chapter. The first question for your reflection is, what did Darius do when he received the report from Tatanai and his colleagues? What was his action? What did you do? And what did he find out? Then, what decree did Darius issue to Tatanai and his colleagues after he had done his research? What additional instructions did Darius give to Tatanai and his associates? And why do you think you are so generous? The next question is, what instructions does Darius give about how these commands are to be carried out? Especially when you look in verse 8 and verse 12. There are specific instructions of how they should carry out these instructions. Then also, if People are expected to obey an earthly king with speed and diligence, as we, we see in 5 and 12. How do you think God expects us to obey him? You know, if you look at the stern warnings given by um, King Darius to people that they should follow and, we, and how they should follow his instruction, uh, if we consider that these instructions are given to people to follow a human king, how do you think God expects us to obey him? What was the penalty for disobeying the king? What will happen if we disobey God? If that was the punishment decreed by Darius for people disobeying an earthly king, what will happen if we disobey God? Can you give an, any example of people in the Bible who were faithful to obey God? And also those who were unfaithful, those who didn't obey God diligently. Can you give me example also, examples of that? One of the things we see uh, is that the children of Israel, the retainees, celebrated. And we are going to talk about that uh, later as well. Is celebration a biblical concept? Because we see celebration, celebration, celebration. Is it a biblical concept? 
and what kinds of things should we Christians today in Zimbabwe, Harare, um, in the 21st century, what things should we celebrate? Why is it significant that the priests and the Levites purified themselves before preparing the Passover? When should we purify ourselves? What people were being referred to in verse 21? Were they Jews or were they Gentiles? So then, was it possible for Gentiles to serve and follow God at that time? Where did the people's joy come from? We hear that they rejoiced. Were they rich? Were they powerful? In what ways was God blessing them? Now, how is this different to the situation where we see in Haggai 1 and 2 when the people were disobeying God by putting off the building of the temple until later? How is the situation different now? Now, so those are the questions that I would like you to go through for your own reflection. But I would like to give you my reflections as well. May I encourage you not to ignore this first part. And if you want these questions, they are on your PowerPoint, yes, but they will also be sent to you on our WhatsApp platforms So as a PowerPoint so that you can go through these questions at your own time without having maybe to pause as, as we are going through this devotion right now. Now, as I was going through the chapter, something caught my attention. And it is after the rebuilding of the temple, after the completion, there is a motif of joy that keeps on coming. And I couldn't help it. I couldn't miss it. Uh, it's something that, uh, that, that, that just, just hit me. And I understand that in Zimbabwe, we, we are robbed of this thing called joy. Many of us, like Pastor Gary said, uh, put on masks, pretending to be happy. But whilst joy is foreign to us, to many of us. And so when I looked at this chapter, when I listened to Pastor Gary preach, joy was a recurring theme. And I looked at the definition for joy. Uh, and according to the West uh, to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it says the emotion evoked by well-being, by success or good fortune, or by the prospect of possessing what one desires. So having joy includes feeling good, feeling good cheer, and a vibrant happiness. But joy in its fuller spiritual sense of expressing God's goodness involves more than that. It involves a deep-rooted, inspired happiness. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So there is joy when we have accomplished things and we feel this happiness. But there is also joy, a deep-seated joy, even when things are not what we would expect them, expect them to be. But we just feel this deep-seated peace and contentment, that deep-seated joy. That is the other form of joy that I saw when I was looking for this. And now, As I looked at this chapter, as I said earlier, I saw the recurring theme of joy. But before I go deeper into that, I just want to read uh, some scripture verses from this chapter. And I would like to read um, from verse 13 to the end of the chapter. And it says, completion and dedication of the temple. It says, then because of the decree King Darius had sent, Tetanai, Governor of the trans Euphrates and Shetha, Bozanai, and their associates carried it out with diligence. So the elders of the Jews continued to build and prosper under the preaching of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, a descendant of Edo. They finished building the temple according to the command of God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month Ada in the 16th, sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the people of Israel 
the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles celebrated. So here is the, the word celebrated. Those with joy who celebrate. The dedication of the house of the Lord with joy. The first occurrence of the word joy in the chapter. For the dedication of this house of God, they offered a hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred male lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, twelve male goats, one for each of the tribes of Israel. And they installed the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their groups for the service of God at Jerusalem, according to what is written in the book of Moses. On the 14th day of the first month, the exiles celebrated the Passover. The priests and Levites had purified themselves and were all ceremonially clean. The Levites slaughtered the Passover lamb for all the exiles, for their brothers, the priests, and their, and for themselves. So the Israelites who had returned from the exile ate it together with all who had separated themselves from the unclean practices of their gentile neighbors in order to set to seek the Lord, the God of Israel. For seven days they celebrated with joy the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because the Lord had filled them with joy by changing the attitude of the king of Assyria so that he assisted them in the work on the house of God, the God of Israel. So I saw that the word joy, the word celebrated is found three times in, in this chapter. And the word joy is also found three times in this chapter. And this joy came after they had done a couple of things. It just didn't come. You know, the joy, there was an investment. They invested something for them to have this joy. They had repented of their sins and obeyed God. Remember, at the call of the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, they resumed the building project. These guys had purified themselves and were ceremonially clean in verse 20. And they had also separated themselves from the unclean practices of their gentile neighbors. So we see that it was an investment first before they actually had joy come their way. They were not centered on material things. Their joy was not centered on material things. It was centered on God. Even though it would give them both spiritual and material blessings, but their joy was centered on, the, on more on the spiritual. You can see that when they did the celebration in verse 16, in verse 17 actually, it says for them, for the dedication of this house of God, they offered a hundred bulls, 200 rams, 400 male lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, one for each of the tribes, and they installed the priests uh, going on and on and on. We see that with this joy, it was not a joy that was only in receiving things, but it was also a joy that caused them to want to give away. So as they were celebrating, we many times we think of celebration as something that we do for our own good. We eat, we enjoy, we party, we bry. But here, when they, they were filled with joy and were celebrating, they were actually giving to God. They were not receiving. They were actually giving to him. And did you see the number of animals they slaughtered for God? So they actually did something. They actually you know, they first repented, they obeyed God, they continued to separate themselves, but they, they celebrated. We all need to repent. We all need to celebrate. As a nation, we talk about how we have been robbed of joy because of material lack. We do prayer meetings to the extent that even the president called it National Day of Prayer on the 15th, just a couple of days ago. If as a nation or as the Church of God think that a miracle will just happen and that joy will come without us making an investment, we lie to ourselves. 
We see that when the children of Israel were not repentant, when the children of Israel were not obedient to God, when the children of God did not separate themselves from the uh, practices of pagan nations, the blessing of the Lord was not upon them. But when God spoke to them and they did something, they did something. They were filled with joy. And because they were filled with joy, God's blessing, because they had, I mean, they had, um, they had uh, been obedient and they did all these things, the blessing of the Lord overflowed. So as a nation, if we think that a miracle just happens whilst we still live the life we have always lived, we live, we don't change our ways. We expect God to do our bidding just to give us joy. We are lying to ourselves. We need to work. We need to do something. So we all need to repent. We all need to put God at the center of both faith and practice. What we say should align with what we do. We all need to be obedient to God's word. We all need to purify ourselves. We all need to separate ourselves from the conduct of the world. It is a shame when Christians, Muslims, Hindus, African traditional religious leaders hold a joint prayer meeting. Christianity has one God. And Christianity has one mediator, and this mediator is our Lord Jesus. We can only commune with our only God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is not through Muhammad. It is not through the many gods of Hinduism and Buddhism. It is not through the ancestors. Mixing these is going hunting with a shotgun. It just sprays the pellet in the hope that one of it will hit the target. That's not what we do with Christianity. We need to go hunting with one bullet, and this is Jesus, a targeted, a targeted way of reaching God. So when I see people joining hands from with all other religions and saying we are, we are, we are praying together, we, what, what we want to achieve is a common good for our nation. There is a problem, folk, because the problem is that is syncretism. And my nation, Zimbabwe, and my continent, Africa, is at fault and is rampant with syncretism. And we should separate ourselves from that. And that will command a blessing from God. Now, what is stealing your joy? What is stealing my joy is the question that I asked myself as well. Because sometimes I find myself not very happy. I find myself uh, lacking joy. Is it an unrepentant heart? We need to ask that question. Is it a disobedient heart? We need to ask that question. Is it an impure heart? We need to ask that question. We just need to do something. From the sermon, Pastor Gary said some profound statements. He said, joy does not come from making up your mind to be happy. Joy does not come from having a lot of things or having a lot of power. Remember the words of Jesus. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but for faith his soul? What can you exchange for your soul? We are also told in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Doing what is right makes us happy. If we do things right, we'll be happy. Joy comes from having a right relationship with God. Joy comes when we love God and obey Him. 
joy comes from glorifying God. And I remember Pastor Gary quoting from the Westminster Catechism saying, um, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That is our mandate. I just want to thank you all for being with me today as we go, went through these reflections. I hope you will have a joy-filled week and I hope that you will seek after joy by doing those things noted above that we need to repent and obey God. That we need to purify ourselves, to separate ourselves from the conduct of the world, to do something for God. Let's not just pray and expect a miracle. Let's, let's be clear of our identity. Who are we? Who do we mix with? We need to be careful that the world should not get into the church, but that the church should go out into the world to fish the world and bring the world to Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. Thank you for allowing us to meet in this way. Though we know that um, this is not what we are used to, but we are kind of getting used. We pray that um, we continue to feed in your, on your word and may you help us to be obedient to you. For you have said in your word that obedience is better than sacrifice. Help us, Lord, to, to stand for who we are, but also give us joy. May you quicken our hearts to do that which is right. And after doing so, we know that we will be filled with joy. May we have joy in you, joy in our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we finish, as we go through the week, may you continue to help us to abide. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. A couple of reminders. I remind you that uh, Sunday we have communion. So be prepared before the service. Prepare your heart to meet with God's people, to meet with the Lord on this day and to commune with him on the table. Prepare the elements as well. And as you can see on the picture, um, prepare whatever elements you have in your home to represent the, the bread and to represent um, the cup. Another reminder is that tomorrow at uh, 5 p.m., you can tune in if you are a young adult or a teenager to Instagram, ePulse, um, where you will have a discussion with other teenagers and young adults following up on the Bible class lesson from last week. Now, before we close, before I give to Uncle Charlie to lead us with the closing song, I just wanted to say thank you to you all for joining me. Uh, may the Lord bless you as you go into the week. May he keep you. May he give you a joy-filled week, a joy-filled month, a joy-filled year, a joy-filled life. The Lord is good and he continues to be even when we have all the things that are causing us harm in our world. See you on Sunday, same place, but at 9 o'clock a.m. And God bless you. sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my days to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. 
Lord, I lift your name. 